You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. Today on the show, we're going to get a chance to talk about this past week's episode with Doc G from Diversify. Also, we highlighted this at the very end, but in the interim, since we've recorded that, he actually started a podcast, What's Up Next? So maybe we can get a chance to uh, discuss that as well. And help me with this. I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I'm doing quite well. Yeah, actually, uh, I recorded an episode of What's Up Next. I think it's going to come out later this month. I think they said at the end of December, maybe into early January. But yeah, I'm really impressed with the podcast. It's a neat roundtable. They have like one general idea. And it's both Doc G and Paul Thompson, who we met at a Camp Fi down in Florida. So it's a good show for sure. Well, Brad, I actually had an interesting situation. So I was kind of doing my bill roundup. And you know how we always talk about it's important to track your expenses because you never know, you know, if you're not tracking your expenses, you just won't know where there are inefficiencies. And so I've kind of have followed that mantra. And because I'm tracking it, I became aware that my, uh, my internet bill with uh, Verizon Fios just crept up from $59 a month up to $89 and 99 cents a month. So like we talk about cutting the cord, you know, and cord cutting the cable and just having internet. But when your internet is going up to close to a hundred bucks a month, it's like, well, what's the point? They just, they've caught on to us. This is no longer working. I logged online just to see cheapers. How did this happen? And apparently when I slipped out of a two-year contract that I had with them, that allowed them to then hike up my rates by $30 a month. And apparently if I go back into a two-year contract, then I can get it back to the $59.99, which I will definitely be doing. But I was so irritated by this that I was thinking, man, I I need to come up with a system. And I I, uh, was starting to look around and do some research and I stumbled onto something called BillFixer.com. And I was so intrigued that I decided to give them a test run on this particular item. And and the way they market it is that they will do all the heavy lifting for you. So you know how we talk about how it's kind of irritating and annoying to periodically go and check your rates and periodically go and negotiate your price back down and get a better deal. Well, this is what they do. They do the phone calls for you. And then whatever they're able to save you, then you pay them half of that for the first year. And then, you know, from there on out, the savings are all yours. And I'm thinking to myself, I want to be efficient. I want to be aggressive. And I hate the fact that these companies are taking advantage of my not wanting to get on a phone with them to do this. Is there a way that I can outsource this? And I think that I'm very okay with that. So I'm giving them a test run now, but if they can like beat that $59 a month, I'm going to be over the moon. Okay. Wow. This sounds cool. You're paying them pretty much like a 50% commission on the savings just for the first year. Am I hearing you right? That's exactly right. And there's like a full on list of the ones that they can actually do. Like it's not just cable. I mean, they have a list of like hundreds of different providers. So if you have any like subscription service where, you know, they just try to sneak it up on you because you know, you're a customer. Like, I don't want to go talk to retention. I don't want to be transferred from customer service to sales. I don't want to do any of that. But what I would like to do is have in my to-doist, right. That I know I need to call and then just on there say, all right, guys, go get them. Right. And see what happens. Well, so, Okay. I've heard of a service like this before. I'm not sure. I don't think it was Bill Fixer. I I suspect that people will respond in the Facebook group with other services of this type or I guess on the comments of the the actual post for this. But I was always curious how they have the authorization to call for you. As stupid as it sounds, do they impersonate you? Do they do you give them some type of power (laughs) of attorney or like what do you do? I don't really want to (laughs) know. (laughs) <laughs> it looks pretty reputable. They say that we work with all your favorite quote unquote providers, direct TV, AT and T Comcast, charter, AOL, time Warner, Sirius dish, optimum century link, Verizon frontier, RCN sprint and pulse. This episode was not sponsored by Phil, BillFixers.com, <laughs> but I might be a fan because I don't want to talk to any of those people. But what I will say is when I set up the account, it was incredibly simple. 
totally free to set up the account. You just go and select which provider you want them to negotiate with you on. And then they have you upload your last bill and they say, oh, by the way, we may need to verify some additional information. So for your login for that company, you would need to provide them. I believe it's your like, I think it's the password for the login that you go on to. I can, I'd have to get more details on that, but basically you upload some sort of verification thing. And then on top of that, you'll need to upload a bill or a statement and they can use that and run with it. And then, yeah, they, they literally make the phone calls. In some cases they say it's like three to five hours worth of work that they're on the phone, getting you the lowest rate, but because they do this over and over again with these different companies, they know the patterns and the routines, you know, especially the script, like on the other end of this line, there's a customer service agent that is following a script and if this, then this, like it's very, very little of this is subjective. It's like they're following their flow chart. These people know the flow chart. And so there's a high chance that they're going to get a better rate than I'm going to get. Yeah, that's cool. That sounds like a good service. It's funny because you mentioned Todoist and Verizon and literally in the last three days, I got a message when I opened up my TV that said your Verizon contract is running due in the next 90 days. And I actually went to Todoist and I already had a recurring task that I had set up essentially every two years on December 15th, call Verizon to renew the contract or renegotiate. So it was cool to see Todoist really working for me. I mean, I, I know it works. I use it every single day and it's the most essential thing that I have, but it was neat just to see it, to see it actually work like that. But unfortunately, I've got to make this call to Verizon in the next couple of days. So I'll be curious to hear your update on this bill fixer thing. Yeah, it's pretty cool, man. I, I might actually even reach out to them and see if they want to talk about this a little more. I mean, on their website, they say that they have saved people more than $3 million in aggregate on their monthly bills. And it's just two brothers that, again, we're, we're solving that pain point mentality that we talk about with Nick Loper on, from Side Hustle Show. I mean, this is just yet another example of this. And to be honest with you, it's funny. I start seeing that whole pain point mentality everywhere now. I mean, personally for myself, things that I can solve. And it's interesting, like once you start thinking this way, uh, I think one of the things that we were talking about earlier in the episode was I don't have any ideas, right? Well, it's kind of a mindset thing. And once you start thinking a certain way, like what, what are, what are pain points in my life? What are things that are suboptimal? What are things that I wish were easier, better, more efficient? Why isn't there something to make this easier? Once you start thinking like that, ideas kind of overwhelm you and you're like, well, what do I actually want to do? But it's cool to see somebody that actually took action on something and $3 million in monthly recurring bills that have been resolved. That's amazing. Yeah, that's pretty cool for a startup. I don't know how long ago they started, but I suspect there are bigger companies in this realm. But yeah, if you like them, then uh, who knows? We'll see how they grow, right? Yeah, absolutely, man. And you know what? It reminds me, your Todoist game is at another level. I think I got bogged down in the weeds of like actually mapping out my daily activities on Todoist. And it strikes me that it's definitely those reoccurring events. So I think I'm actually going to start moving my Todoist activities to reflect some of these more major things that I need to do. That way you don't get overwhelmed with the Todoist noise. Well, let's go ahead and take a few minutes and talk about this past week's episode with Doc G. And, you know, one of the things that we kind of ended with was talking about that article, Top Five Regrets of the Dying. And, you know, it was one of those that while this by no means is a morbid thought process, I mean, this really is the ultimate advice to your younger self. Nobody is at their deathbed thinking, I wish I had bought more stuff. It's just, there's just zero chance of that. And knowing that it allows us to then kind of inform our decisions in the present and makes this a mindset conversation, which spills over into every other aspect of our life. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And this is not morbid at all. To me, it's looking at what is that advice that people who have lived a full life, what advice would they give to us? I mean, I think a lot of these, I wish I had the courage to express my feelings and I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. So many of us, we do lose touch with these people who were so important to us in life. And it's, it's so easy, right? Because we're busy all the time. And believe me, I fall prey to this all the time. There are people who I consider lifelong friends who I haven't talked to probably in eight years. I mean, that's absolutely absurd, but we all fall prey to that busy trap. But how do we get over it? We actually step outside our comfort zone or outside of the normal day to day and we reach out to people. I think it's just so crucial. And you never know like who you reconnect with, right? Who you have a 20 minute phone call with that turns into, Hey, next time I'm visiting New York or visiting California or wherever it is, you get together with them, right. And rekindle that friendship. It, it can be as simple as just reaching out. And I'm really trying to do better at this because there are these people that you just don't know when the last time you're going to see somebody is. And that's, that's really sad to me, Jonathan. 
You know, Brad, it, I, I love that point and I love that priority and it strikes me. It's something that I'm grappling with as well. How do you balance being the person that says yes with the simplicity that you lose when you say yes? That was actually something that I didn't really get a chance to bring up in this episode, but it's like finding that balance point. And I'm curious how you have kind of tiptoed around that because you've been able to reclaim a lot of the time that you were putting into your original nine to five, but what has that afforded you and how do you find that balance point now? Yeah, that is a really good and deep question, Jonathan. And and believe me, I don't have the perfect answer for this. Clearly, I crave simplicity in my life. Having a schedule that is overburdened, it just stresses me out. You can't be packed all the time, or at least I can't, and feel like I had a productive day or productive, not even productive, that's the wrong word, just have like a satisfying day or a week because I get this feeling of anxiety. And I think maybe that's my own issue, but, but it's the truth. I get this feeling of anxiety when I see something on my calendar every single day, even if it's something fun, even if it's something I'm looking forward to. So I think it's important to schedule the framework of your life around the things that truly are important to you and maybe build in specific hours of the week where you can do this connecting. That's part of your schedule. And not to make it sound like it's this crazy, like, formulaic schedule of, Hey, I reach out to my high school friend Wednesday at 3 PM. That's not a very fun life, but maybe Tuesday nights you reconnect with a friend in town or you have board game night or something like carve out a specific time during the week that that's your time. And sure, it's not going to be the same people or families every single week, obviously, because you have lots of friends and you're trying to connect with people, but at least maybe make it that time. In a in a kind of weird pivot, I talked a couple of weeks ago how Laura and I, after I got back from Chautauqua, I realized that I was kind of frivolously wasting hours and I just wasn't satisfied with how how my normal days were going. So we've made it that Wednesday is kind of like our date day. And sometimes that means three hours in the afternoon, we go to lunch and take a walk or do something or this past week. I had a bit of a busy day just with choose if I calls and things, and we scheduled a game hour. So it was 10 a.m. We played Ticket to Ride America and we played Monopoly Deal. That was our fun connecting hour. Right? Can I just and, point out that you don't have a date night, you have a date day and how epic <laughs> and awesome that is. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good. I mean, it just it gives us something really to look forward to on Wednesdays. It's it's fun. So hopefully I answered your question. It is that never ending fight or balance, let's say, between simplicity and doing all the fun things that you want to do in life. So, you know, this is a to be continued conversation, but it's something that I'm thinking about and grappling with certainly on a week by week basis. Well, let me continue the conversation because you've inspired me. And it's something that I asked you the question, but it's also something that I've been grappling with as well. And a lot of it, there's some similar overlap in my own life with some of the things that you mentioned. One, building your ideal day. What does an ideal day, an ideal week actually look like? Not that you have to stick with it perfectly, but just have you even thought about that, right? The year is made up of sequential weeks. The weeks are made up of sequential days. If you kind of create a pattern for your life, then that's something that the structure is something that I think most of us thrive on, even if we don't realize it, because if you don't like the structure, change it. And then the second part of that is being present with anything that you're pursuing, being present with your spouse, being present with your child, being present with your friends. Like one of the things that I've become increasingly aware of is quality time with your wife or with your partner is not sitting on the couch, watching TV. It just, that's not time together. It's you being present and you putting actual quality time in. And so if, if, if you look at it and you say, well, I got all these things going on and it's all stressed out and it seems like it's inconvenience to everybody. I think one of the things you got to look at is and we talked about this with Larry Hagner from the Good Dad Project. What did he say? Don't bring home a fat wallet and an empty heart, meaning you give everything to your friends and to your job, and then you come home and you have nothing left for your family. It seems to me that if you if you take care of your family first, if you're present for them first and you make that a priority, then all of these other things like building in your friends, your communities, everything else kind of falls into place after that point. And so I love the idea just by you saying as part of your daily structure hey, Laura and I are going to have this date day. How much more freedom and flexibility does that give you when you're then reaching out to build your community, reaching out to build that friend circle? It gives you that balance point. And so like you said, it's never something that you're just done with. You're always working on improving it. But it's it's really inspirational for me to kind of hear how you're implementing that in your life. 
Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. I, I appreciate it. And, you know, this episode with Doc G I thought was fascinating because it really delved into these serious, introspective topics. He talked about purpose, identity, and connection. And I think that pairs incredibly well with what we had talked about previously on the podcast. I think in the episode with Don Wetrick, when he was quoting Daniel Pink, who said autonomy, mastery, and purpose. So there's the overlap here of purpose, but Doc G is saying identity and connection. And I think connection for us has been something we've talked about since the very first. Connecting to friends, family, community is just essential. It's just such a crucial part of being a human being. I know we talk about it all the time, but we just we can't say it often enough. And I think doctors in particular, and, and obviously just because we were talking with Doc G, maybe that's why it was highlighted, but it's that aspect of identity that, that they grapple with. Because when you are a doctor and you've gone through the gauntlet of becoming a doctor, it's a massive piece of your identity. So he's struggling with, I don't need this anymore from a financial perspective. Frankly, it's something that wears me out. It exhausts me, but it's also a massive part of my identity. How do I walk away from that? And for him, it was, well, I need to find my identity in something else. I need to find my connection in something else. And so I think that's one of those things where it just points how powerful it is. You need to be thinking about this ahead of time. If you decide to walk away from a, a career or a job that no longer lights you up, that you no longer enjoy, you don't want to just wake up and say, oh, what now? You need to be thinking about what, you know, it's not what are you retiring from, but what are you retiring to? What does it look like to design your life post your exit date? And it's fascinating to watch him light up increasingly. I mean, he's been writing posts on his blog. He, he writes one post a day. He's quite literally Seth Godin levels of prolific. But beyond that, he's someone that is just diving into community. And it's really cool to, to watch him grapple with this. He had a brilliant quote where he said, we tell ourselves the stories about our lives that make it bearable or better yet, magical, mystical. That just stuck out to me. And it really does tie into this identity that he's talking about, where you need to have a sense of who you are. I know I've gotten a lot of this from Tom Bilyeu from the Impact Theory podcast. And it's a lot about thinking about, I'm the type of person that. That's the prompt that Tom Bilyeu always gives. And for me, I've come up with something that I'm the type of person that does the right thing even when nobody else is looking. That's my own internal identity. It follows me through my whole life. I don't know where I came up with it, but it's just something that has stuck with me and it's, it really has become important. So I would ask everybody out there to think about your identity. What's the story you tell yourself about yourself? Who are you? This is not just idle thought. What we think about ourselves is so crucial and what we think about the world, what kind of outlook we have is the world, a scary negative place, or is it a positive open place? And a lot of it starts from how you think about yourself and your own place in the world. You know, I think what we have tried to do and what we've tried to cultivate is just a space to have conversations about the things in life that are truly important. And it's not just our career. There's so much more to this facet. What is it that you want to do? And this is why for me, this episode is such a mindset episode. And it strikes me that I, it's not too late. You know, you, your life is not over. Your story is frankly just beginning really. And it, what is it that you want to build? I've been reading and spending a lot of time looking at this very famous book called Mindset by Carol Dweck. And it strikes me as I'm reading that, that in the concept that she's highlighting is this idea of fixed mindset versus growth mindset. Fixed mindset being I am this. Growth mindset being I can develop into anything. You know, the world is kind of open to me. You know, you're not, it's, it's not that you are as an individual or are fixed mindset and everything or growth mindset and everything, but there are different aspects of your life where you just have these limiting beliefs that, oh, I'm a bad artist. Oh, I'm not creative. Oh, I'm not anything. If you allow yourself to be pigeonholed into that, or even worse, if you have other people tell you that you're something and you allow yourself to believe it, it limits your options. And what you've done, hopefully by you know being a part of this community, reading this type of content, listening to the podcast, hearing ideas from other people, is you realize that can be and do whatever it is that you want to do. There's very few things in life that are out of reach for you. In fact, I was just thinking about it. Maybe you can make the case that if you decide to start playing baseball in your early thirties, it's going to be very difficult for you to catch up and become a professional baseball player or pick a different sport. It doesn't really matter, but there's an aspect to this where 
you need to start playing this at a young enough age because you're hitting your peak physical condition in maybe your 20s or 30s. And these individuals have kind of have shorter shelf lives where by the time they're getting to their late 30s, early 40s, they're basically done. That's it. That's all I could come up with. Basically, anything else is whether or not you believe that you have a fixed or growth mindset, which is incredibly empowering because guess what? I don't want to play professional baseball. I don't want to play any professional sports. I mean, this is not even to say that you couldn't do recreational, but whatever it is that you want to do, if you believe that you are the type of person that can develop this, that put the time in, then you can do anything. And, and, and this is where, this is what blows my mind is as I start to put this together, people say, well, what are you going to, what are you going to do with all your free time? And, and the question that I hear more frequently is how in the world did I ever have time for a, a nine to five? Because there's so much that I want to do. And because I believe about myself, the story I tell myself is that I can learn anything. Whereas when I was a kid, maybe I had that idea, oh, I'm a bad artist. Oh, I'm not creative. Now I feel like if I can give anything time, it becomes a fun problem that I can solve. And Brad, I see this with you. It's different, right? For you, it's jujitsu and it's board games, which is overlap there. And it's CrossFit, but it's like things that you never would have imagined. But now it's like, I get to learn this stuff and I get to treat it as a challenge. And who knows where I'll end up a year from now, but I guarantee you a year from now, I'm going to be better at this than I was currently. Yeah. And I think that growth as a human is so important and having something to progress towards some goal just to get a little bit better. It ties into also limiting beliefs and fear. Doc G said, fear is essential to growth and can motivate you to move towards more meaning and purpose. And Jonathan, I I didn't even actually tell you about this. I can't believe I'm, I'm kind of saying this out loud here, but at Chautauqua during our presentation, I talked about limiting beliefs and I talked about how if I could have one skill or one talent, it would be to be able to sing. You, you probably remember me mentioning that. But what I, what I didn't tell you was, incredibly, a couple who was there at Chautauqua wound up getting in touch with me a couple of days later and saying that they bought me singing lessons. Oh my goodness. Which is incredible. I mean, the most heartfelt, incredible gift. It was just unbelievable. And yeah, I mean, they had been working with this one individual who gives singing lessons in their local area and also does it via Skype. And basically, had they said, oh, we want to get you singing lessons. I would have said, no way. Like, you know, I I would have found some excuse or, oh, that's too generous, et cetera. They literally bought me this and said, here it is. It's already paid for. You have to do it. So I literally had my first singing lesson yesterday on Skype. I was so worried about this. I (laughs) I can visualize you having bringing out a cold sweat. (laughs) Oh my God. For like days, I was like counting down the hours. That first time where the guy said, all right, open your mouth and, you know, he follow along with this. And I thought I was going to run away. That's how debilitating this is for me. The fact that I have built this up in my head that I cannot sing, that I'm incapable and I'm just the most God awful singer on earth. It's amazing. Like, I don't know where this story came from, but now I'm leaning into it and I'm trying, you know, a- am I going to continue with singing lessons beyond these four? I, I don't know. Hang on, hang on. Maybe. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe, right? Maybe. I told Laura, we can't tell any other human beings on earth that that I'm doing sing lessons. Now I just told the whole podcast audience, but (laughs) just 150,000 people, no big deal. Just a slight (laughs) variation there. (laughs) But I mean, this is, this is the important stuff and I'm not trying to hide anything about my life. This is the important stuff in life is leaning into discomfort, finding those areas and exploring them. Why am I so afraid of this? Why am I mortified? Jonathan, you and I had a, a short interview with uh, Clark Howard yesterday that's going to air in, in January, and that potentially is going to go to millions of people. And I was 0% nervous about that, whereas singing in front of one other human being made me, like like you said, break out in a cold sweat. So that's the kind of thing you have to lean into. And this is about finding that fear and helping it let you grow as a person. I'm so proud of you, like genuinely, genuinely proud of you for doing that because I would be afraid for you. And just to show you, like, even though in myself, I had the phrase, I can't draw. I spent basically all of yesterday watching tutorials on how to draw. And I find myself doodling on everything because you got to be bad at something before you can be good at it. And I'm loving it. I'm absolutely loving it. Now that you have that agency in one aspect of your life, it spills over into everything. And imagine how empowering it is to say, I'm the person that can learn anything. If I want to, if I value it, I can learn anything and to go through life like it's an opportunity. And to do that, part of what we have to achieve is bandwidth, which is why the conversation on the finances is so important 
It's why it's like these two are paired together as this life optimization strategy. But it's an excuse. Talking about the finances is an excuse for us to get there personally for ourselves and to help you as an audience get there and then relate your stories of what you do with that newfound freedom. That's why we're here. And that's why this conversation will continue for years into the future. Yeah. And you're right. The finances, it, it allows you that space, right? Once you get your money under control and once you're in a upward trajectory, like with net worth and savings rate, et cetera, then you have the space to explore. What does it mean to be me? What does it mean to be a human and to connect with other people and find this purpose and identity in your life? And you talked about opportunities. Doc G talked about new beginnings. He said, YOLO is a no, no. And we have hundreds and hundreds of new beginnings in our lives. I just thought that was a really incredibly open-minded way to look at life that every single day you're on this planet, be faced with potential new opportunities and you just have to be open to them. I think that's the important thing is, and it ties perfectly into that growth mindset from Carol Dweck is be the type of person who can be open to new opportunities and to learn things and don't have that closed mindset of, oh, I'm not good at X, right? Just because you've built up this story in your head. So I mean, am I going to ever be a world-class singer? No, I mean, there's no chance, but am I going to learn significantly? And could I get to a point where I'm not mortified to sing in front of another person? Like, yeah, I believe I genuinely can. And who knows? It's just cool to explore. So to me, that's the key. Brad, I totally agree. And, and honestly, I'm grateful for you for being willing to share that. And it's, I think it's empowering both for me and for people in our audience that are saying, well, I don't want to do that because I'm afraid I might be embarrassed or I'm not going to be good at it. You have to be bad at something before you're going to be good at it. For most of us, for 99.999%, you're going to have to go through that path and you know what? It's okay. In fact, it's awesome. So uh, I hope that that was as encouraging for you as it was for me. And Brad, what I thought we could do now, we teased this on our episode last week, but we are bringing Marla from our advanced travel reward strategy episode back on the show to talk about updates for 2019, travel reward strategies for 2019, how to go about planning for the companion pass. This is just going to be a wonderful conversation for those of us who like to optimize our travel plans. Here it is. So Marla, so excited to have you back on the show. There was so much actionable content for people that are interested in travel rewards in the episode that we did with you, which was episode 77. But we love the idea of having you back on the show to do updates for our community. And we thought maybe we could start by just catching up with you. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me back. Oh, absolutely. Tell us, do you got any big travel plans going into the beginning of 2019? I do. I'm excited to be going back to Hawaii for New Year's. So this year I'm going with another group of friends. I'm kind of joining on to my one set of friends trip and then encourage them to invite another group of friends. So we have nine of us going for the new year. So I think it's going to be really fun. Bringing communities together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that actually ties in perfectly, Marla, with what you had talked about the first time you were on. You set up these grand plans with groups of friends. Did you help them with rewards points for this particular Hawaii trip? I must confess, I think, uh, Christmas, New Year's is not the greatest time to use points. So this one, I was able to use the Alaska Companion Pass. I didn't help my friends with their travel. They just uh, are spending the big bucks. But sometimes you got to splurge, right? Absolutely. So I take it one of your friends are, are going with you on that Companion Pass? Yeah, my sister's coming with me. Oh, nice. Very cool. So any kind of interesting redemptions on hotels? Are you doing Airbnb? What kind of accommodations? Oh, I am taking advantage of the Hyatt. I still have lounge passes on kind of a grandfathered explorist status, which gives you access to the lounge. So that one's a good money saver because the lounges at the Hyatt's, they tend to give you pretty much a full breakfast and you can almost make it a full dinner and cocktails are cheaper. So that part's nice too. So my friends have the same status. So we do plan to lounge it up while we're in Waikiki. <laughs> yeah, very nice. Is that, I know there's like a rather inexpensive Hyatt. I think it's like a Hyatt place just off of Waikiki? Are you staying at that or at the, the nicer Hyatt? This time I'm staying at the Regency, which is one category higher, but you're totally right. That Hyatt place looks really good. And I think it's a 15,000 points a night. So that's good value in Waikiki, as is the Holiday Inn on Waikiki Beach. So those are two really good affordable redemptions for people who want to. Um, and just and for people out there, what points would they use for the Holiday Inn? Oh, IHG. And IHG has a new card that's pretty good. So you can actually get two different IHG cards, I think. Or if you have the old one, you can definitely get the new one. 
each of which offer you a free night stay with the card sign up. So it's pretty good value. And I think we talked last time about the Accelerate promotions that they always have at IHG. So I find it's a really good one to gather up your points and they have some kind of offers. And plus, it seems to be quite an affordable hotel. Like even at Christmas, I think it was only around 180, 190 a night. This is so interesting because this is something that I have experienced as well as I'm planning to do a family trip is that as you pointed out at Christmas, probably specifically, and maybe new year, the travel rewards is obviously not going to be as good of a deal in terms of like when you're doing your point redemptions, if you're going at peak flying time, then there are less travel seats allocated essentially for people that are trying to use their points. But hotels are, those points are pretty standard and consistent. And I found that even when you're trying to funnel your travel rewards redemptions into a holiday, If you're not able to use it on the flights, you should still be able to use it on the hotels and get some of the benefits with some of the lounges at the airports. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's good advice. You can always find some sort of value add because of our hobby. (laughs) Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. And and yeah, Jonathan, definitely a good mental framework to approach it. Sure, airline flights are going to be really difficult to use with traditional frequent flyer miles especially around the December holidays. But yeah, there are other ways to save. You can save on rental cars or yeah, like you mentioned, hotels. If it's a standard room that they have available to book with cash, then most of the hotel chains are going to allow you to use your points. And they don't jack them up in price just because it's a holiday. It's just, this is the standard award chart and this is what the hotel costs. If they have a room, you can use your points. So yeah, that's a really attractive way to save money on, on travel, even at the peak times. Yeah. And actually I should say that, that choosing the Hyatt Regency in Waikiki and paying cash was not because I couldn't use points. It was because the cash rate was actually a really good value. So I always choose carefully how I'm going to use my points. So how do you approach that mentally? Like, do you have an internal value of like what you would use points on? Does it depend on the currency? Like let's just use Hyatt for, for example. What kind of value are you looking to get out of your Hyatt points or I guess potentially Chase Ultimate Rewards if you would transfer them to Hyatt? Right. I I do have a mental calculator that's kind of consistent. You can read a lot of the travel blogs and they'll they each have their own charts for values, but I consider Ultimate Rewards the most valuable and then those are transferable to Hyatt. So basically the Hyatt points I also kind of guard like gold. So I take a basic value of the one cent for those when I'm choosing if I'm going to redeem it because I know I can get so much more value if I use it another way. So I don't know if that quite makes sense. But for example, if it was a 15,000 point per night redemption, I would say, okay, that's about $150. So if the rate is close to 150 or even under 200, I'll probably use cash instead just because I know I can get more than the penny of value out of those points if I redeem them elsewhere. So Mario, I would love to kind of use this opportunity of having you on the show to answer some listener questions that we've gotten just both by messages and also by voicemails. And I wanted to start with a message that I got from Emily asking about the companion pass. And as this is really the perfect time to start thinking about and planning your companion pass, um, I think this question really teases us up to talk about some great information. So Emily says, my husband and I are set to move into our first home. And because of this, we're planning on tackling the Southwest companion pass and we can easily hit the dollar amount with the purchase that needs to be made. My question is, if we hit the $3,000 spending on the business car before the end of the year, but not before our first bill cycle, will they apply that as completed in 2018 or in 2019? I hope that makes sense. Now, I know that you could probably answer this question specifically, but this is kind of a high risk strategy if you get it wrong. So I'd love for you kind of almost to step back and explain to people what the companion pass is and what an appropriate strategy for someone should be that's hearing about the companion pass in December of 2018. Okay. Well, it sounds like we're going to be safe for all of our listeners because no one's going to have that high risk situation given that it's already December, probably too much of a rush to apply for a card get that spend done and risk that it hits in 2018 versus 2019. But to back up, the Companion Pass, as we've talked about before, is one of the best value and most fun travel rewards that you can go for. And basically what you need to do is you can earn the right to bring a friend or guest or spouse or child, basically any person you like with you for all the flights that you take in the year. 
And the pass is good from whenever you earn it in a year for that whole year plus the following year. So it can be good for up to two years. At this point, we're probably talking about earning it by March. So you could earn it in March. It would be good for all of 2019 from from March through December. And then again, good all the way through 2020. And that lets you bring another person with you on every flight free of charge everywhere that Southwest flies. And they do fly to some international destinations now, like uh, Costa Rica, destinations in Mexico, destinations in the Dominican Republic, other Caribbean locations. Am I missing any, Brad? Well, Hawaii is coming up pretty soon, which is exciting, right? I know. I've been holding my breath and my companion pass expires, so I'm not going to get to jump on that train like I hoped. But definitely a good one for this. Anybody who's applying now, that's an exciting opportunity to look forward to. One more little cool thing there. If you have a child like I do under the age of two, it's actually all three of you, right? Because you get your lap carry child plus your companion. So it is it is perfect (laughs) for that young family. It has just been absolutely amazing. That's awesome. I think it's a good opportunity to um, borrow somebody's baby even. (laughs) (laughs) Don't do that. Don't do that. It sounds like a bad strategy. (laughs) At least you said borrow. (laughs) That's so funny. So Marla, how how do you actually earn the companion pass? Try to tell everybody what you need to to hit that requirement. Yes. So you need to earn 110,000 Southwest Rapid Rewards points. The best way to get 110,000 might sound daunting, but they have a couple new cards actually with Southwest and they have four different products that you can choose from three are personal cards. And one is a business card. They have implemented a new rule where you can only have one personal and one business at the same time. So ideally you could get both of those, but each card is a 40,000 point sign up after you spend a thousand dollars on the card. So not terribly daunting to get that first 40,000. And then you're also earning points for any spend while you have the card. So you would wind up automatically with 41,000 points on the personal card by the time you hit that minimum spend of $1,000. They've also added a new element where you can earn up to 20,000 more points if you spend $12,000 in the first year of holding the card. So that would delay you getting your companion pass and hitting the bonus, but it's an awesome opportunity for people who are frugal and who don't spend a lot on their credit card if they can just be a little bit patient. So I think the timing and why I wanted to talk to you guys now is kind of perfect for people who want to start looking at 2019. They can earn it maybe even in, well, I guess they'd still earn it in 2019 because you'd hit the bonus in the first three months. So you wouldn't get to enjoy the card for the whole two years, but you'd still get a whole year without having to be a big, heavy spender. So it's kind of a good conservative approach because you know some of the cards have very high spending limits and not everybody can put that much on their cards. So anyway, there's the fast track where you could get it and have it for almost two full years. And there's taking a little bit longer and at least being able to enjoy it for a whole year with not as much uh, spending hardship. Yeah, that certainly makes sense. And just to clarify, we're recording this on December 4th, 2018. So any credit card information we talk about or Marla mentioned that's all accurate as of this date of recording. It's important that when you go to apply for a card, you, of course, since this will be in the future when you listen to it, just make sure that everything is still the same when you go to apply. But and Marla, I just wanted to kind of talk about Emily's email real quick. So she was asking, I guess, about if they hit the spend in December of 2018, but that the card I guess the credit card statement didn't close until January of 2019. Would she run into an issue? And your answer was, no, there's no issue. It's based on when the statement closes. And then after that statement closed, I guess that's when Chase sends their points over to the Southwest Rapid Rewards account. And that's the point that matters. Because I guess why Emily is asking this is you can really kind of screw this up. If you get your points, let's say you open a business and a personal card And some of the points hit in December of 2018 and some of them hit in January of 2019. Well, you have a real problem on your hands because as you alluded to, you need to get 110,000 points. You need to earn 110,000 Southwest Rapid Rewards points in one calendar year. So that's why Emily didn't want to mess this up. So yeah, it's really crucial that we kind of dial in on this and let everybody know That's why we're being so specific about this. So the ideal scenario, as Marla laid out, would be 
to get one of each of those cards, the business and the personal. And then the currently the business has a 60,000 point bonus. So coupled with the 40,000 point bonus, plus your minimum spend, plus some additional spend on the card, you can get to that 110,000 points. And then once those points hit your rapid rewards account, you instantly get credited with the companion pass. And as Marla mentioned, that is good through December 31st of the following calendar year. So why she was saying so specifically, it's nicer to get it at the beginning of the year if you can, is it just extends the period of time that you have the companion pass. In theory, if you got all the points hitting your account in early January, you have 23 and a half months to have the companion pass, which is remarkable. Yes. But I think that risk point that Emily was alluding to and that Jonathan was saying, like, you really can screw it up. So I'd rather be safe than sorry and and uh, make sure it's all like if you lose one month or six weeks, it's really not the end of the world. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm totally with you, Marla. And, and yeah, this podcast is going out, I guess, on December 7th. So like you mentioned, it's highly, highly unlikely that someone would listen to this, open the card, wait until the card showed up and then hit their spend and have the statement close all in December. So it's it's very, very unlikely. But for me, I'm with you. I would not want to mess around with that. And, and I would and just I do feel- know at least one individual that got a little too aggressive. They got caught up in a shopping vendor and they had their statement closed in the current year and then got the other one in the following year. And it is just it it it's a heavy hit when that actually happens. So it's better to be a little bit more conservative and get your companion pass for the full two years. But at its most simple level, I just wanted to to reiterate. So currently the way the points are standing, the business card has 60,000 points and it has a $3,000 minimum spend, one of the personal cards, and these are kind of variable so they can change, which is why Brad was referencing that. But the personal card currently has a 40,000 point bonus after you spend $1,000. So just a point bonus alone, once you hit those minimum spends would put you at a hundred thousand, but then you get points for the minimum spend as well, which currently that gets you another 4,000. So you're at 104,000 points, which leaves you with a 6,000 point difference. Once that difference has been bridged, you get your companion pass. If that is in early 2019, you would have your companion pass for all of 2019 and all of 2020. And man, that thing is the gift that keeps on giving because Brad, we talked about there not being a lot of travel spots for people around the holidays. Like Southwest has zero blackout dates. Yeah, they have none whatsoever, which is great. So it's, it's just a simple function of their cash price. So ideally, if you can get their want to get away fares, which are available on all their flights, I guess, until they're, they're booked up, then you can get this at a pretty reasonable rate. I mean, I've gotten some Southwest flights for, I think only like five or 6,000 points on a one way, which I thought was amazing. And yeah, just one tiny little addition here is Southwest is a transfer partner of Chase Ultima Rewards. But when you transfer those points, they do not count towards earning the companion pass, okay? So if you had 110,000 Ultima Rewards points and sent them to Southwest, that would not help you earn the companion pass. Now, once you already have the companion pass, you can send those ultimate rewards points to Southwest and you essentially get double value for them, right? Because you can use those points to book Southwest flights. And because you already have the companion pass, you can take advantage of, of getting that free companion. So that's a really important distinction that I, that I wanted to point out. That was a good one, Brad. And also I did want to say, since this podcast is going to go live pretty soon, Southwest does have a really good sale on right now until December 13th. Normally their sales are only a couple of days, but this one's eight days. So lots of their flights are on sale right now and their schedule is now open until the end of May. So it's a good time to do some planning ahead and get your get your flights at a really good price in points or cash. And also uh, the other benefit of Southwest is all their flights are fully cancelable up until 10 minutes before a flight. So there's really no risk. So book away, get the best flights. You can always cancel and rebook if the price comes down. You can change without penalty. It's a very flexible airline. And Marl, as I'm saying this out loud, I'm just putting myself in the shoes of a listener. And we said, all right, well, you need to have, you know, in order to apply for this companion pass, you're going to need to get a personal card and a business card. And maybe this individual is saying, well, what does it take to apply? What do I need to have or do in order to apply for a business card? Any thoughts on that? Yes, you can actually apply. Like, There's really no shame in our game and you can definitely have a business card even if you're just thinking about starting a business. So don't have any worries about applying for one. Just think about 
you know, we're all interested in side hustles. You might even just be thinking about a side hustle. The only challenge is you'll apply for the business card. You just use your social security number in the place where it asks for your business number. Obviously, if you have a business, use your business number. But if you're thinking about starting a business or you have a side hustle, you know, it could be reselling on Amazon or eBay or Craigslist reselling. The good one that I think works for almost all of us is you might have an Airbnb in your home or be thinking about running an Airbnb from your home. You might have to do a phone call with the credit card company asking you, what is your business? What is this all about? How are you going to use the card? So you need to have your answers ready for those questions. Like your business doesn't have to have earned any money yet when they ask you. You don't have to have any employees. You can just say, I'm starting a business and I would like to keep my bills and costs separate from my personal expenses. You know, what's really interesting, Marl, is that I set up one of my first business cards right after I was planning on starting Choose I was like, I have this idea. I think it can be something. And it, truly, it was them giving me that business card. And I know this is going to sound dumb and it's going to sound silly, but like when I got approved for that business card, that's when I suddenly felt like <laughs> I had a business, but I want to put myself in the shoes of a listener. Maybe someone that's like, well, I think I, you know, I have an idea for a business. I have something that I want to do, but I'm on this application. It's asking me for my revenue and I think it could earn this amount, but I don't, I don't have any tax statements to like prove that out yet. How should that individual answer that question? I guess on the form, you could put a minimum amount of income, like $5,000 or something, but I think you can also write zero. They're probably going to call you and you can say, you know, my forecasts are saying I'm going to make 25,000, but I don't have any income as of this date. So I do think it's important that we're legitimate and talk to them like you are a real business person getting started. So you don't have anything to prove yet, but you, you can't wait to get going and you anticipate great revenue. Thank you, Marl. That I think that's really helpful. And I just was putting myself in the situation of someone that's maybe applying for their first business card, but I think that's totally spot on. All right. I I'd be very curious to talk about maybe some, some additional cards, ones that you're getting very excited about right now, ones that potentially give you a little bit more flexibility. What other cards should people be thinking about? Well, these are two that I haven't even applied for myself. I've been waiting, but I think it, the time is right to apply for at least one of them right now, depending on what you have available in terms of you know, your card strategy, everybody's going to have a personal plan. But at least one of these, they're, they're kind of the same concept with just two different credit card companies. But Barclay Card has the Arrival Plus, And that card is a completely flexible points redemption card. You want to be a traveler because the points are uh, to your advantage to redeem toward travel. So the only person that it wouldn't work for is somebody who never wants to get on a plane or stay at a hotel. So I don't think that's anybody in our audience. But this is the best offer they've ever had for the card. So when you sign up, you get 70,000 points after you spend $5,000 in the first three months. So it's a little bit of a heavy spend, but we can talk about how you can hit those spends with some spending that you might already be doing. But this card is the best card for beginners or those who always give you the argument, oh, I never redeem my points. It's impossible to redeem them. So I think going back to what we chatted about before, with Christmas or New Year's or difficult times where there might not be flights available on points. This is a card that is simply use the card to buy your flight or your hotel or your train, your rental car, anything to do with travel. And then you choose once you have the points in your account to just erase those costs. So if you have 70,000 points that you earned by applying for this card, you've got $700 to go towards something uh, that you want to erase from your spending. So it's kind of like magic. It's the best one to encourage for your parents or a friend or somebody who is sort of skeptical about how they're going to use the points. And really $700 for a sign up is pretty amazing. Yeah, Marla, I totally agree. I love the Arrival Plus. Actually, my wife, Laura, just opened it up after the bonus jumped up to 70,000 miles. So yeah, this is a card we get a ton of value from. And like you mentioned, you can essentially use it for anything that codes as travel. So if it's really essentially anything, right? Like, so rental cars, anything from a travel agency, a tour operator, all of these code as travel for the credit card. And you just use that credit card to pay for the travel after the fact, like you said, you log in and it's almost like magic. You just erase, erase it. And yeah, with the minimum spend on that. So it's $5,000 in the first 90 days and you get two points per mile. So 
I guess you would earn 10,000 points for the minimum spend plus the 70,000 bonus. So that gets you to 80,000, which is worth $800 of free travel. So yeah, that's a huge, huge bonus on the Arrival Plus. And yeah, I know uh, the Venture card also went up significantly with Capital One, right? Yeah, I think and Capital One also added, they used to just be a cashback or you know a card similar to what we just described with the Arrival Plus, but they have actually added a transferable points program to airlines. So it's become very flexible. And I think this is their highest sign up. They might've once had a 100,000 mile sign up, but the sign up right now is 75,000 miles after you spend $5,000 again in three months. It's also two times the miles on all your spend and they waive the $95 annual fee for the first year. So it's another super versatile card. Same thing that you can redeem it for. You can kind of erase those travel expenses right off your card, or you can now transfer to a whole host of airlines. Some of the best are Air Canada, Aero Mexico, Cathay Pacific, Flying Blue, and Avianca. Those would be the ones that I would consider to be good redemptions. Those ones you get 1.5 times the points instead of two times the points. So that may sound worse, but in some cases it'll actually be better. So it, when you're looking at your redemptions, sometimes the cash price of a ticket is expensive, in which case redeeming for miles will be the better value. Yeah, Capital One has really stepped up here. It's amazing that they're now in the transferable points game. For the longest time, it was Chase and Amex were the two big guns, I guess. Citibank had transferable points with the thank you points and Starwood, which I guess now don't exist anymore. But uh, yeah, now Capital One is is in the game with transferable options. So not only do they have this remarkable bonus offer, but these points are now transferable. And while those airlines might not sound all that fantastic to someone listening to this, Marla, you can take advantage of airline alliances, right? So when you're saying Aeromexico, that's Sky Team. When you're talking about Air Canada, that's Star Alliance, right? So people can use those more than just for those airlines, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And I think last time I was on, we talked about that because it, it can sound confusing. So I think it's just earn those points and then you can look into all the ways that you can you can redeem through these alliances. But definitely Air Canada, when Brad says it's Star Alliance, the main partner would then be United Airlines. So obviously everybody's familiar with that one and tons of flexibility with how to use those points. So uh, yeah, don't be scared. Just try it. Once you've got the points in your account, then you can start thinking about redemptions. So we always talk about kind of the art and the science of collecting travel rewards. Part of it is that the easy part really is earning them. And the more uh, scientific part is how to redeem them. And to our audience, Capital One did not make this offer available to most of their partners. So for this specific card, you actually need to Google Capital One Venture in order to find that specific deal. And Marla, I know you talked about strategies for people that are trying to figure out smart ways of hitting their minimum spins. And I'm just curious what thoughts you had on that. Well, I think some of these new limits, they've gone to the $5,000 minimum spend in three months, which sounds like gulp uh, for some of us who are frugal. So I just want to encourage people to think about, don't start spending money that you wouldn't ordinarily spend. Start thinking about the things that you already spend, and maybe you can front load some of those expenses. So in particular, like what I do is I'll prepay my utility bill for a few months, or I'll prepay my internet or my cell phone bill. Some other ideas are you can, um, if you shop wherever you buy groceries normally or wherever you buy gas normally, you can go in and buy a gift card and then uh, in subsequent months, just use that gift card to pay when you would have normally used cash or a credit card. So it's just front loading expenses. And that means you can more quickly get to the $5,000 minimum spend without spending money that you wouldn't have otherwise spent. And also to say it another way, it's not necessarily that you need to front load $5,000 of expenses, but if your normal expenses would only come to three or four, you would just need to augment the difference and you're front loading that maybe extra $1,000 or $500 or whatever it is, you're bumping it up into a prior month. So it's not as extreme as, oh, by the way, you need to prepay you know, your, your entire $5,000 electric bill for the next 24 months. No, that is a very good caveat. Thank you. <laughs> okay. What I love about your particular flair of travel rewards is how you blend community into the conversation, which brings me to this wonderful conversation that I want to have with you because you are doing a group trip with 
Amy and Tim from Go With Less, two of our favorite people who we talked to in episode 79. You guys are doing a trip to Tempe. Tell us about it. Well, I'm, it's really their trip, and I'm just jumping on the bandwagon, but I figured since I was coming on to talk with you guys, it could be an interesting experiment to see how many Choose the Fires want to join us. So I met Amy and Tim through Brad, actually, at FinCon, I guess, a year ago. And Amy, in particular, like, talk about community. She is just such a go-getter and so much fun to be around. So she, or they, had written on their blog about what they did going to Tempe for a, she called it a three-day run to the sun. And so she has a great post on that, um, on Go With Less. And they just invited me and said, we're going to do it again, and we're putting it on our blog. So anyone else who wants to join us, hopefully there'll be a Choose FI meetup with the local people in the Phoenix area. They said they had 12 people come last year to just come meet them at the hotel. So this year it's going to be on January 22nd for three nights. And it's at the Hotel Moxie, which is a Marriott property in Tempe. It's right by the university. So they had a whole bunch of fun kind of being frugal sun worshippers and taking advantage of free entertainment. The hotel has bikes and pool tables and all the amenities and, and features that the university offers. So it sounded like they had just a great time. And I thought with this Southwest fair sale happening right now with people having companion passes already, or at least it being kind of an inexpensive place to go, it's a category three or four at the Moxie. So it's definitely a better points redemption than a cash redemption at that time of year. So if you have some Marriott points, come meet up with us and we'll put more details on what we're planning. And if we get a crazy number of people, then I'll call the hotel and see if we can uh, book a meeting room or something. That is so right. awesome. <laughs> I'm so excited because I could visualize you guys doing a trip, like almost like on an annual basis to a different place all over the world and using travel rewards of, oh, hey, by the way, we've done all the heavy lifting. We found the sweet spots. We know that this community has tons of travel rewards points. Where do we want to go? I mean, this could be a thing. I know. It could be like a, a inexpensive way to plan your own camp. <laughs> That's so cool. So Marla, if, if someone is listening to this and actually does want to go, I mean, yeah, sure. They're going to book a hotel, but like, how do they get in touch with you guys? Like I wouldn't just fly out there and show up at the hotel and hope that I'm going to run into Marla. How do they reach out? Is there an email address? Like what, do, what do people do? Well, I think the best place to read about it is on the go with less blog. So hopefully you'll link to their post on it and then I will give Amy the heads up. So we'll put something on their blog for getting together. And certainly anybody can reach out to me on Facebook and we'll get more details figured out from there. Awesome. Well, we will absolutely have the link to that post in the show notes for today's episode. I fully support this endeavor. Marla, thank you so much for coming on the show and updating us for 2019. This has been a blast. Well, thanks for having me and uh, happy holidays and all the best for the new year. Yeah, Marla, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show. One thing I just wanted to throw in here is we are very pro travel rewards points here. We talk about it all the time, but we're also very pro responsible credit card habits. That's kind of the, the underpinning to this entire thing. If you are not paying off your credit card on time and in full every single month, please disregard everything we just talked about and all prior episodes where we talked about travel rewards. That's kind of table stakes to get value out of this. So hopefully anyone listening to Choose FI is paying off their credit cards on time and in full every month. But yeah, that's, that's really, really important. I wanted to point it out here. And I just wanted to highlight that on time and in full isn't just something that you do because you remember to log in each month and pay it off. It's actually a button that you press on the portal where you basically tell it, hey, each month, whatever is on this card, I want you to pull all of it out of my account and pay it off on time and in full. It's like it's literally a setting. This isn't something that you need to create willpower for. This is something that you literally just need to turn on. And if you're afraid to turn it on because you're like, well, I don't know if I'm going to have enough money in my account to cover it, then that probably tells you that you're not the right person to be using credit cards. I mean, this is not something that if you have a credit card problem, you should be considering. This is an advantage and a benefit to people that live below their means and are just changing not how much they're spending, but where they're putting their spending in order to be able to basically look at the problem a little bit differently and travel the world for nearly free. So I just a good disclaimer, and thank you, Brad, for taking a second to highlight that. Well, unfortunately, my friends, we come to the end of the episode. Now, as you know, we like to finish every episode by doing a drawing for a copy of a book that we have found useful. And there are three books that we offer. The first is J.L. Collins' book, The Simple Path to Wealth. The second is Dominic Cortuccio's book, Des Design Your Future. And the third book from Vincent Puglisi, Freelance to Freedom. 
If you want to win a copy of one of these books, all you need to do is just go to choosefi.com slash iTunes, follow the instructions there and leave us a short written review. And then send us an email to feedback at choosefi.com, letting us know that you left a review and what screen name you left it under. We give away one book for every five written reviews that we get, and we announce the winner on the Friday roundup. Brad, how many winners do we have today? All right, Jonathan, we have one winner today, and the winner is Matthew. And Matthew said, once you start, you can't stop. I've been on the FI journey for a long time. I just thought I was the weird guy saving his money and fighting off lifestyle inflation. I had come across other popular FI bloggers and podcasters before finding Choose FI, but nothing resonated with me like Jonathan and Brad's perspective on the topic. They are amazing interviewers and effortlessly bring out the best in their guests. I've even listened to them on other podcasts, and it's amazing how this partnership brings out the best in those interviewers. If you're looking for a no-frills, down-to-earth approach to talking, not just FI, but becoming a better person as well, you've found your tribe. Join or start your local Choose a Five Facebook group. Get involved and help the fire spread. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.